deacons will be passing out a, uh, my sermon notes for today. And I invite you to uh, follow along in the outline because uh, that way we'll save time. I have quite a few scriptures that I want to comment, read and comment on this morning. By the way, it's delightful to be back in Santa Clarita. A wonderful church, wonderful church service. Uh, I hear all kinds of music in various churches. I just love yours. So my compliments to the board and everyone involved with the music program. Uh, some time back, I preached a sermon on the second coming of Christ. I'm going to touch on another aspect or two of that message this morning. Uh, but today, the subject is really part two, and I've, I've entitled it Signs and Wonders. Let's start with the scripture at the top of the page, Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope. Now the words blessed hope practically bring a tear to my eye. I know of no other expression with respect to the second advent of Christ more touching, more beautiful, than that two-word expression, three-word expression, the blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Adventists believe in the blessed hope more so than most other churches. It's an urgent matter for us because Adventists believe that when you pass, you sleep until Christ calls you forth from your tomb or your grave. But in other denominations, there's not quite the urgency of expectation with respect to the second coming, because in essence for them, when you pass, you're already going there. Your soul is going there anyway. And so the passage of time is for those who have passed on, not really a problem. They're already with the Lord and the kingdom. We need Jesus to come because... Now, I'm going to give you a scripture here on this that may be new for some of you. We need Jesus to return because we have lost so many loved ones. If you're a little bit older, like me, you've lost so many family members and friends. Isn't that right? Now, there's a call, or now these days, text message that comes to me quite often because over 49 years I've pastored so many churches. And uh, the text message will read, Sister Dolores Burnley, this is the one from this past, this week. Sister Dolores Burnley just fell asleep in Jesus. Our church brothers and sisters are very precious to us. And we want to see them again. Just like we want to see our wonderful parents or children or <laughs> friends over the years. And we need Jesus to return so that we can have that great reunion day. The only path that leads to the eternal kingdom goes through the portals of the tomb. That is, until the very end times when some will be translated or raptured, whatever word you prefer there. The only path that leads to the eternal kingdom goes through the portals of the tomb. I want you to look at this next scripture with me, 1 Corinthians 15, 17 and 18. Paul said, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, and those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. I want to put two, 
two fragments of this passage together where it says, if the dead are not raised, first part of the verse, then Christ has not been raised. If the dead are not raised, now the last phrase in the, in the passage, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. The great resurrection day, which we just heard about this morning in the scripture read, depends upon the resurrection of Christ. And then, because that, that resurrection day depends on the resurrection of Christ, we have the blessed hope to see those who have fallen asleep in Christ. Everything depends on the resurrection, on the one hand of Christ and on the other hand, on the general resurrection. If Christ was not raised, if there's no general resurrection, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, Paul says, are lost. We need Jesus to return. Next section, planet Earth needs Jesus to come back. I know the nations need Christ to come back, but planet Earth needs Jesus to come back. From Romans chapter 8, look at this scripture. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The children of God will be revealed at the resurrection. The person that comes out of that tomb or that gravesite will be the magnificently beautiful or handsome you that God had in mind when he gave you the spark of life. Um, some of us get a little beaten up, you know, in the birth process. And others of us get a little beaten up by life. We don't look as good as God intended us to look. But that will change. At the second coming of Christ, the children of God will be revealed in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. The, the natural world of which we're a part is enslaved by aging, by decay, by disillusion, will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. It's not just you or your friends or family or the church at large to be resurrected into freedom and glory. It's the earth, planet earth itself. Now in a previous message, I quoted the following two scriptures, and I need to touch on them a little bit more today because I've gotten you know, notified by several, not just in this church, but elsewhere too, that maybe I forgot one scripture. Let's look at it again. In a previous message, I quoted the following two scriptures. No one knows about that day nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. If you believe that God the Father has, knows the end from the beginning, if you believe that, then he has to know the date when he's going to give Jesus the green light signal to come back to planet Earth. He's always known that date. If he knows the future, then he's always known that date. Therefore, quoting the next scripture now, Acts 1, 6, and 7 at the bottom of the page. So when they met him together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. The date for the second coming of Christ has always been known unto our Heavenly Father. The date is set. And every day that passes, we are one day closer to the coming of Christ. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Now that is so important to the church because, you know, hey, I'm a minister's kid. Not, my father was a pastor. I got two uncles who were Seventh-day Adventist pastors. I've got a great uncle who was a congregational minister. And let me tell you, there was one thing about Adventism he really envied. Our tithing system. 
They don't have that in the congregational church, and so the pastor, every year he had to visit all the church families, help raise his salary. How do you like that, Paul? Every day that passes, we're one day closer. Now, I want you to look with me. This is page two on the other side of the first page. Second Peter 3.12. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, Second Peter says, godliness. He, he's appealing to us to be godly. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Now, this is the scripture that's been brought to my attention several times. Um, well, let me mention here again that there are three, three tasks that uh, need to be accomplished before Christ returns. The first task, Matthew 24, 14, the gospel has to be preached to the whole world. Then the end will come, said Jesus. Now the second task is prophecies that are directly related to the return of Christ have to be fulfilled. And the third aspect of this is that God's people, not, not just church members now, God's people will need to be ready. Jesus said, watch and be ready. And, and so uh, these three things have to be accomplished. And God has always known when his people will be ready. It's not something that is conditional upon our cooperation with the Holy Spirit. And so time goes on and goes on and goes on. And, and uh, you know, decades and centuries pass, and they pass because it's our fault. We didn't get with the program and yield ourselves completely to the indwelling Holy Spirit. Um, now, I mentioned having, you know, grown up in the church with so many pastors in my family that I have heard so many messages implying that Christ is just not going to come back until the church is ready. Uh, is that the 144,000? What number is it? Who, who, who is it? It's not in our power to delay the second coming of Christ because God has always known when that date will come up. The date is set. And God takes everything into account, the prophecies, the proclamation of the gospel, and the church being ready. Yes, we need to be ready. We need to be working on it, making sure that Jesus is our best friend, making sure that we're connected with heaven through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, of course. But the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the wars in the Middle East is not happening because it's our fault that we weren't ready. It's just what has come, what has come upon this earth. And uh, the Lord knows when we're going to be ready. Remember, sometimes we're too pessimistic about that. We set the bar too high. Elijah said, I'm the only one. How far off was he? He was one of 7,000 and one, according to the Lord. God has always had true saints in the church and all the churches and in the world in order to fulfill a, a, the mission of showing what the love of Christ can accomplish. So today, my specific subject is the prophecies. Are the prophecies being fulfilled in remarkable ways today, which would argue that, which might be evidence that we're getting really closer to that date, the day that has been set. Now, uh, I mentioned uh, a condition last time I was talking with you about this subject. I mentioned a condition I call prophecy fatigue. 
You know, I have a bad case of prophecy fatigue today in one way. Because I got, my poor wife got deluged. Stuff has come to me. Uh, maybe you can tell me about it. Did, was the world supposed to come to an end September 23, or is it October 23 it's coming to an end? September, and then the second date was October 7. It's what? The second date was October 7. October 7! Oh, we're spared again. <laughs> when I get people, and uh, they send me sermons, you know, long expositions on how everything is conspiring to come together and the day is at hand, um, I get prophecy fatigue. And some of us have what I call time of trouble trauma. Uh, we really don't want to hear that much about uh, the end times because the end times are ugly. Jesus said they'll be the worst times ever. And who wants to come to church to hear that kind of gloom and doom? Well, we're going to work on that this morning. First of all, with respect to prophecy fatigue, Jesus said, what? Watch, that was not advice, that's an instruction from the Lord. He said, watch. And it may be that, you know, we're tired of hearing the evangelist cry wolf, and the wolf is never at the door. It doesn't matter about that. Continue to watch. He warned us against saying, my Lord delayeth his coming. That is the attitude of the wicked servant in the first parable that Jesus told about how to be ready for his coming, Matthew 24, 25. Now about the time of trouble. Um, I'm, I don't have this on the outline. I, it's Revelation 6, 1 to 8. You have your Bibles? Can you go there with me? Revelation 6, 1 to 8. I just want to present, maybe it's not new to you, but I want to present maybe a new emphasis this morning. Uh, Revelation chapter 6. Now you heard Revelation chapter 6 presented one way. I'm going to present it another way. And you, excuse me, you, you just don't worry about it. You believe what you want to believe, okay? Now. In Revelation 6, we have six of the seven seals. Now, a, these seals, this, this is a, what you have here is a, a last will and testament that is done in the Roman style. The Roman style of a last will and testament would be to have seven witnesses. You roll up the papyrus, uh, that has your last will and testament on it, you roll it up, and then wax seals are placed on the outside of that document. Seven of them. See? That's a very official last will and testament or trust fund or whatever they had back then. As each one of the seals is broken, now the, the document is not open until you get all seven broken, but as each one is broken of a vision appears, okay? And what concerns me this morning about the seals is the first four of the seals, when they're broken, a vision appears. And we're going through this really quick now. The first seal is of a white horse in chapter 6, and that's in verse 1 and 2. And that's a war symbol. There before me was a white horse, its rider held a bow and a crown. Now in verse 3, you have the second seal. And in this case, it's a fiery red horse. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword, symbol of war. Now we come to the third seal. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. 
Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, quarter of wheat for a day's wages, three quarters of barley for a day's wages, do not damage the oil and the wine. Now this is a famine symbol. Those are famine prices for the, the grains mentioned. Famine prices. So you have two symbols of war, you have now a symbol of famine, and now comes a symbol of death and the grave. And here we see this now in verse 7. Lamb opened the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind. Okay? I don't know of any scripture that identifies the horse symbol as being a symbol of the church. I don't. I looked it up. I've looked it up repeatedly. There, there's no such symbol. All right, now, what, did the, what these four horses and riders represent, we're told right there. Uh, I don't have to be creative or inventive. We're told. You have your Bibles open. In uh, this is verse, uh, this is verse eight. Here's the pale horse. And then it says, they, T-H-E-Y, they, that's the four horses and their riders. They were given power over a fourth of the earth. Evidently, each, each one of the riders and horses affects one quarter of the earth. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. They are judgments from God or judgments allowed by God. War, famine, plague, wild beasts. That is, that's not arbitrary. In ancient times, if you had a war, you couldn't plant your crops, you couldn't harvest your crops, the enemy would probably burn your crops. So war led to famine. Weakened people were subject to infectious diseases, plagues. And then when they're down to just a few survivors, the hideous beasts of the forest, the carnivores, come out. It's not arbitrary. They're all connected with each other. Now here's the striking thing. Look again at your outline, if you would, please. Um, let's see, where is that? I think I moved my... It has a list of scriptures. Yeah, here, here. About the time of trouble, Revelation 6, 1-8. Note the cross-reference scriptures about the four dreadful judgments. These four horses and what they mean is found repeatedly in the Old Testament where they're called the four dreadful judgments. Uh, look at this. Ezekiel 14, 12 and following, for example, is probably the main one. This is not invented or by, by John the Revelator. These are symbols drawn from the Old Testament where it states clearly what they mean. Now we're turning to chapter 7, verse 1, okay? Now I've got good news for you. This good news is going to cure your time of trouble trauma. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, <coughs> holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. God will seal his people. And until that is accomplished, the angels hold back the winds. There are good reasons for believing that the winds are the horses and their riders. No time to go into a long study on that. 
But these judgments are held back until God's people are ready. Now what this tells us is, and this is so important, this is the good news. God is in control. Don't worry about it. God is in control. He's holding back the winds of strife, and things won't happen until there are good reasons for them to be allowed to happen. Now this matter of the seal, I'm kind of fascinated with that. And I, I suggest you take your Bible concordance when you get home and spend a lot of time looking up references to seals, what they meant and how they were used. Basically, I'm just going to tell you, when God stamps his seal on your forehead, that's a statement that you belong to him and he's going to preserve and protect you. God is going to identify his people. Now, there will be some who pass because they're martyrs and so on, but God will preserve and protect his people as a whole. And now listen, if we're really living, you know, in the end times or getting close to them, then there's some really good news here. I want you to look with me down here at verse uh, 9. After that, this I looked there before me was a great multitude. This is after the 144,000 uh, was mentioned that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Now, verse 13, one of the elders said, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? And in verse 14, Sir, you know, he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, let's just assume that you and I, we're, we're really living down here towards the end of time. And uh, we're going to be part of that great multitude. Uh, you need to know what God has in mind for the people who go through the difficult times before Jesus comes back. It says now, continuing verse 15, they are before the throne of God, serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they be hungry, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's the reward that God has for the people that he has prepared who are strong enough to be reflectors of the glory of Christ in the end times. What a fantastic statement of blessing God has in mind for this, for those of us who live through it to see Christ coming back. So I read these things and it seems to me that the future is exciting. To me, the future's not dismal and terrible, it's exciting. I just hope I'm still around to see it all. But now I'm going to take three signs of the times. You grew up with signs of the times, right? You grew up with the magazine. And you grew up with all the statements, wars, famines, famines plagues. I'm just going to take three. First one here on, on the outline, Daniel 12, 4. Increase of knowledge. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be what? Increase. Back when I heard the evangelists preaching this, they were talking about the steam engine. <laughs> and cars. And uh, the... Uh, Television had just been invented. What a modern miracle, you know. Those things that excited us when I, back in my day as a youth, those are nothing compared with today. I have a list for you, and you could add to this list. Artificial intelligence is coming. Robots that will be smarter than you and take your job. Uh, 
I, I, I was discussing a proposed surgery with uh, my urologist. And he let me know that in their surgical clinic, they have a, a robot surgeon named Sophie. That gave me such comfort. <laughs> because my wife's name is Sonia, and Sophie is kind of a, you know, a little nickname based on Sonia, I've been told. See. Wow. Well, I don't want it. I don't want that surgery. If it's Sophie or Sonia, I don't want it. Um, and ab about the cloud. Have you heard about the cloud? Not those fleecy things in the sky, but uh, I don't, I, I can't, I think it's, I think it's giant computers all linked together and they share all their information and they know everything about you and they run everything in, in this cloud of information out there. Driverless cars and trucks, how many are you looking forward to just going to work and have your car drive itself? Can I see your hand? Oh, a few hands. I don't think it's we're going to work out myself. <laughs> New cures for cancer. You know, I read this book, The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee, big fat book on the history of the treatment of cancer. And whoo, what a depressing book. But now, dramatic things are in the pipeline coming down, friends, in terms of cancer treatments. You know, I have a friend and his wife is a senior vice president at Kite Pharmaceuticals, and so I did some research, you know, on Kite and bought some stock in that company because, wow, this is not a new medication. It's a new treatment, not radiation, not, not uh, chemo. This is what it is. They take blood out of your body, they freeze it, they send it to a lab. And in that lab, they unfreeze your blood and they train your T cells, your killer anti antibody cells, they train those T cells to identify a particular kind of cancer, in this case, lymphoma. To, and these cancers, you know, they have the unique ability they are so demonic, they have the unique ability to disguise themselves, go into camouflage, so your T cells can't recognize them. But no, no, Kite Pharmaceutical, they train your T cells in your blood to target <coughs> the cancer cell. They can see right through the camouflage. Juno's out there, Novartis is out there, a lot of, it's the, there's a land rush right now, a gold rush of big companies trying to get into CAR-T, CAR immune, immunological therapy. This is incredible, incredible. Daniel was told, knowledge will be increased in the end times. What about big data? Do you know anything about big data? I read a book, my wife's grandson-in-law, it's a tank, it's a long stretch of a family relationship. He had a book called Everybody Lies. You think so? <laughs> and it's analysis, an, an analysis of big data that they get from Google searches and other sources. People tell the truth on Google when they search. And it found out that a lot of things that we took for granted about people aren't really true. The opposite is true. Big data. And many more things. We live in exciting times. Not every sign of the times, not every wonder of the times is going to be bad. I'm so glad I live at a time when knowledge is increasing exponentially. And I, I had a statement here written down. Let's see. Um, 
Well, this statement in Google, yeah. See, I've got, your future preacher will be a cell phone. Did you know that? <laughs> They're just going to program the cell phone with the best preacher's messages. They'll set it on the pulpit, and, and you get your message that way, okay? So anyway, I want to I want to get to this here. According to NASA, for example, nanotechnology, uh, what's that? Okay, nanotechnology knowledge is doubling every two years, and clinical knowledge every eighteen months. But on average, human knowledge is doubling every thirteen months. It used to be that human knowledge doubled once a century, every century. Now this, on average, human knowledge is doubling every 13 months, according to IBM. This is Watson, the supercomputer. The build out of the Internet of Things will lead to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. Now, remember I did I mentioned from my previous message that the, the illustrations Jesus used, that we can use to analyze this material. He said, he talked about the fig tree and he talked about the circling of the vultures. He said, when you see all these things coming together, then you know that the time is, is ready, that the, that the coming is at the door. See, it's not just one or two things. It's when whole, whole galaxies of things related all start coming together. And we live in the most fantastic time when knowledge is being increased. Now, I got to hurry up here. What, it's not two o'clock yet? <laughs> um, Jesus mentioned wars, rumors of wars, and revolutions. This country is in an absolute war for its survival. An absolute third world war for its survival. Ever since the Peloponnesian War of 431 BC, that had the democracies of the Greek city-states on one side and the, the uh, tyrannies of Greek city-states on the other side, a long war, the tyrants, the dictators, cannot stand democracies. They can't stand it. And we have China and Russia today, they can't stand democracies. And every little which way, through trade or stealing, uh, stealing of intellectual property, they're trying to pull us down. Iran is a theocracy. They can't stand democracies. Do you know why these Muslim tyrannies hate democracy? Because they say it's man-made. It's man-made. What about North Korea? What is the problem there? Maybe someone after church can explain to me why this guy, this fat kid with a funny hairdo, <laughs> hates us. Well, what did we do to him? <coughs> we are under siege with cyber attacks. These, these insidious Malware and viruses, wanna cry, pet you, hacking goes every week. It's a new, your data has been stolen. And then the drug cartels. You know, 200,000 people in Mexico have been killed in drug violence. And now we're passing laws permitting marijuana. I, I don't really know how I feel about it, but I'm, I believe that. The more drugs there are out there, the more people will get dependent on them. We seem to be giving up. And then you have the opioid crisis. Vicodin, Percocet, morphine, heroin. Last year, 41,000 people in the USA died from opioid uh, uh, overdoses. Then this ISIS group. What is the problem with these terrible barbaric people? You can't reason with them, can't negotiate with them, can't ignore, can't ignore them. This is the parable of the fig tree again, where all these things come together. Now last, Revelation 11:18. 18. 
destruction of the earth. Listen to these words. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. There was no way back in John's day for people to destroy the earth. Not possible. How did John the Revelator on the island of Patmos, what led him to predict that down in the end time there will be people destroying the earth? The Holy Spirit. It's an inspired statement. Listen to this statement from NASA. The potential future effects of global climate change include more frequent wildfires. When we lived in Palmdale, we refinanced our house with an Adventist gentleman as mortgage business in Northern California. At 2 a.m. last week, at 2 a.m., they noticed that the cell phone kept ringing, and it was some neighbors. When they answered, the neighbors said, you know, we're your neighbors up on top of the hill. The fire is coming. You have just a few minutes to get out. These wildfires everywhere, not just in this country. NASA says frequent wildfires, longer periods of drought in some regions, and an increase in the number, duration, and intensity of tropical storms. I've never seen anything like the hurricane season that we've had this year. What is behind it is that the sea is warming up. The more degrees of warmth in the Caribbean, the more the hurricane pulls that energy into the storm, the more it powers it. Here's a statement by Ellen White. In accidents by sea and land, in great fires, in fiery tor tornadoes, and hailstorms, in gales, floods, hurricanes, and tidal waves. They, she mentions these are all signs. Now, the last page, we're almost done. One last word from Jesus. Again, some good news from Jesus. In Matthew 24, 3-8, he speaks of other signs of his coming, such as famines and earthquakes. But then he said, all these are the beginnings of birth pains. You know, ladies, those of you who have had children, they tell me it's a really, really terrible, can be an ordeal of pain. Yes, but you go through it for a reason, because you want new life. You want a new son, you want a new daughter, you want children, you want your family. And so these things coming up are just labor pains, because something good is coming. The birth of a genuine new and eternal age.